Hello everyone, Julian Charles here of themindrenewed.com, podcasting to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. Today is the 3rd of April 2014, and I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome to the programme Andy Jennings, who is the lead singer of the fantastic indie rock band Dissident Prophet, whose music, of course, we've just been listening to. Based in Birmingham in the Midlands here in the UK, Dissident Prophet in my opinion, is a strikingly talented and creative band with music and lyrics perfectly matched to a vision for Christian ministry, which I think is very, very inspiring and intriguing. And I'm very much hoping that we'll be getting into exploring that vision as we go along with this interview. So, Andy, it's great pleasure for me to welcome you to the program. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, Julian. Good to speak to you, my man. Now, I've actually only been aware of Dissident Prophet for a couple of months, really, since we were in contact through Facebook. And when we first made contact, I followed through your link back to the treasury of songs that you've got there, the band's website. And uh, I have to say to anybody who hasn't visited that website yet, please do go there. The songs are all there. They're free to download and listen to. It's wonderful, wonderful artwork, I would say. And what really impressed me was the combination of your quality music and your quality lyrics and this vision for communicating the gospel through those songs in really quite a subtle way. In a way, I would say that 
in a way that's sensitive to the kinds of questions that people are asking about life and also sensitive to the times that we're living in. So there's loads and loads I want to ask you about in this interview. But could we start with a kind of uh, snapshot introduction to the band and to yourself and um, also to the general vision that you have for Dissident Prophet? Uh, right, yeah, okay. Well, before I became a believer in Jesus, I was in secular bands and had a bit of success with some record companies, e.g. records and stuff. But then uh, when I got became a Christian, tried to write Christian songs, didn't really work, packed it in, handed it to God, said, look, it's not working. I don't want to do anything that you don't want me to do. 18 months later, doing the washing up, suddenly a couple of songs started coming through. Uh, they were like from God's heart. So he gave me kind of back that urge and that hunger to do so. Uh, and my friend Tom, who'd helped lead me to the Lord, great guitarist, one of the best in the world, better than Robert Fripp. Well, he and I got together and we started writing songs together, praying together, and it was a whole new thing. And then we got together with a couple of other guys who were Christians in another band called the Pink Dandelions. So I was from Hector's House, he was from Doodlebug, that we all got together, got signed after about just doing two gigs. We didn't have a name, then we had to come up with a name, came up with a dreadful name called Dissident Prophet. That's a great name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's all right, really. Just it's just it's just tough if you wear dentures. <laughs> no, I seriously think it's a really good name, actually. No, I think it is actually. I think it, I, I, in time it's actually proved to be the uh, the right name. Mm. But um, yep. So we uh, we did that and started getting together and writing songs. And when was that? When did you form? This is probably well, around about 1993. A mm -hmm. couple of years after I became a Christian, the whole world view had changed gone from just not understanding things not seeing things to suddenly having my eyes open I was blind but then I could see lost but then I was found just like the old hymn yeah. it's just so true and uh, that that kind of spurred me to kind of express the gospel because I'd been I'd, I'd received the grace of God and his forgiveness and I'd been born again and changed and forgiven and I knew God and had a relationship with Jesus but as a result of that came a lot of new ways of looking at things and the Bible things Jesus said opened my eyes to the world we really did live in uh, and I had to express it I had to express the truth about Jesus in the, in, in the words and uh, looking at the way that the world was and yeah that's kind of what happened I always before I was a Christian I'd always been interested in uh, in, in questioning things but when I became a, became a Christian it took on a whole different level mm. and one of the things that I notice about your songs is that uh, you don't do what a lot of Christian bands seem to do which is to kind of sing about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the time, or or to take some verse from the Bible, you know, and and uh, make it into a, a new song. But you tend to, you're sort of very roundabout in the in the way that you comment on things in the world, and then you will sort of leave these clues in there, which I think is really quite intriguing. Right. I I, I can't explain how it works. I mean, if I could work it out, it would be. Yeah. I guess it's God knows how to do it. I don't know. He knows who you are, how you think, and he uses that. You know, my, my, my love for lyrics. I've always liked words in songs that mean things. I've never been a fan of you and me, baby, tonight till the morning li morning <laughs> light and stuff. It's just, you know, I'm not interested in that. Some people love that kind of stuff. To me, it's got to be about something. Even secular artists like Billy Bragg, people singing about something that matters. I always like words like that. Mm. And even people who didn't write about things like that, when I got the words wrong, and when I listened to their songs, my words, I thought, were more meaningful than theirs. And, of course, you late, later you read the lyric sheets and you find out your words are more meaningful than theirs. <laughs> <laughs> and you realise they've sung it wrong. <laughs> and you are the main lyricist for the band, is that right? Yeah, I'm the lyricist of the band, yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how does the music get formed between you? I mean, is it one person basically in charge of that as well, or do you no. sort of piece things together it, between it, you? It's a mixture. I write songs on my own take them to time and we go working on them and then tom and i also work on songs together from scratch he comes up with ideas i listen to things so there's different types of writing songs there isn't a real formula we have uh, there's different types of songs as well some come over a long time or like a kind of thing that's in process uh sometimes it's just a, a couple of notes while you while you're off shopping pushing the trolley, trolley around uh, cut the co-op or something and the idea comes and it comes through really quickly and you get the urge to go and just put it down i mean i don't get an awful lot of time to sit down with a the guitar these days and uh, that's an advantage to me really because it means that the, the idea forms in my head a lot but with tom my friend um and brother in christ it's so cool uh, we're so similar we have exactly the same kind of likes uh, musically it's a strange thing we also think the same we have a kind of like a big gamut of sounds and influences to, to pick from 
And so when we come to write a piece of music, we're not really precious about it because we're kind of happy with how it ends up in the end anyway, because we like all those different types of music within that umbrella of pretty much new wave music, I suppose. Right, yeah. Uh, later on in the interview, I do actually want to ask you more detail about the styles that you've, I don't know whether you've been consciously influenced by particular groups, but nevertheless, there's a, quite a lot in there, isn't it, of different styles that you've managed to make your own. And um, even in that first song that we heard there, Hang Him Round Your Neck, which is a single that uh, was from your early days in 1996, and you put that into your first album, We're Not Grasshoppers, or I've got to ask you what that means in a second. Um, uh-huh. There are all, all sorts of styles mixed in there, so I do want to ask you about that in, in a bit. Um, so I really want to ask you to, if you want to comment about that first song, because when you sent me a list of, of songs that you know perhaps we should discuss, that was at the top of the list. So I did think to myself, well, perhaps that's particularly significant for you. Well, yeah, the reason that it's a significant song, uh, and there was an early recording we, we did of it. Actually, I prefer more. It was more lo-fi. It sounded more like the theme tune to Taxi. Remember that that old series? Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And I remember when we, we came up with that song, I thought, that sounds like Taxi. I love that. It's really That's the one with uh, Andy Kaufman in, wasn't that's it? That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, that's it, man. Anyway, that, that song was the first song Tom and I wrote together, just off the cuff, after praying, sitting down, and we just come up with it. But even the words actually we wrote together. That's strange because I you know I said I'm the lyricist, but actually we wrote those together, those words. <laughs> so uh, uh, that particular song was one, <laughs> probably the only one actually where we both wrote the words. And it's a great song. Could you just go, because I don't know whether people have picked up on the words listening to it there. Could you just give us an idea of you know what the essence of the song was? Uh, really, it's about, well, before I was a Christian, I'd looked at Christianity and all what I saw as church and stuff. And it's just a mothballed religion, you know, uh, and when I became a Christian, I suddenly had a relationship with the living God, with Jesus Christ. And so to me, it was like chalk and cheese. It was really clear. And, you know, I could see that it's very easy to become religious. All of us, are, I think, even myself, we're all incurably religious. I think that's our default mechanism. And when you become a believer in Jesus, that has to go. The kind of Jesus and religion do not mix. Uh, it's a relationship. Uh, religion is, isn't. So I've got a relationship with a person. He's a real man. He rose from the dead. His name is Jesus, Yeshua in, in Hebrew. Mm. So the idea of wearing, wearing a cross around your neck, I have no problem with right, wearing a cross around my neck. It's just that it depends what it means. If it's just wearing a cross around your neck and, your neck and that's a mate, that, that's, that's important to you. Fine. But I guess what I realized that being a Christian could become just a religious act where you pick up Jesus and you drop him down. You, you, you kind of talk the talk. You go to church on, on a Sunday and then you carry on Monday morning on your normal normal way of life. Mm-hmm. And really, my experience has been that it's everything. Jesus is everything to me. When I became Christian, I realized it was about giving everything to him. It was about dying to myself mm-hmm. and living for him. And he is my all, my everything, not just something to be picked up and then put on the shelf, you know. Uh, and so that, that's, that's what that song's about, you know, uh, the love of Jesus and he wants a relationship with us. Mm. And uh, that's why he died on the cross for us. Absolutely, yes. And you say in your testimony that when you were very young, that was the kind of questioning as to what you're actually experiencing in church. That was very much your, your feeling of, uh, well, you know, it looks like this is not really authentic, this Christianity. Do you feel that you carried that, well, really throughout your life as, a, as an experience which you, you've wanted to distance yourself from and have a have a real experience spiritually yeah. rather than this sort of deadness. Yeah, I mean, I actually feel quite angry at it because when you know the real thing and you know that the the fake thing is what sends people off the scent, it makes me really angry. I remember uh, C.S. Lewis writing something. It was it was, it was he made a statement about uh, watchful dragons and passing what it was it was actually a book called past watchful dragons we made, made the point that there are many things diversions stained glass windows churches solemnity uh, rituals that keep us from god and keep us from mm. the real thing they're like a fake version and sometimes we'll accept second best and second best is it's just it's it's nothing compared to jesus i absolutely agree with you but isn't there a sense uh, in which it's possible to you know, for some people actually to have a genuine spiritual life, a genuine Christian life, and yet use some of these things. And, and then for, you know, for us to look at that sometimes and think, oh, well, that's not genuine, because we see those sort of switch off things like a cross, like a stained window. But actually, those people do have a genuine spiritual life. So we, there's a bit of a trap for us as well in that. 
Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it is about your motive. Yeah. I mean, we, two people could do exactly the same thing and have totally different motives. Mm. So, yes, outward appearances isn't what it's about. But really, genuinely, it, you, I get your point. Good point, uh, Julian. You're right. Someone could be really love, in love with Jesus and do something that I think, well, what's the, why do that? I mean, it says that in the, lots of places in the Bible. Some Someone has a special day for this and someone doesn't have a special day. Absolutely. And it, to them, it's great because it's between them and God. But what I found is a lot of stuff that kept me from coming to know Jesus was that stuff, unfortunately, that ritual stuff. I couldn't relate to it because I found out Jesus was a real guy, real sweat and blood, splinters in his fingers. You know, he lived a real life and and a lot of that stuff that, that, that kind of like detracted from that. The nice white looking guy in the stained glass window, mm. you know, looked like an Italian bloke or something. You know, I wanted to get to know the real Jesus and the Bible showed me the real Jesus. I had lots of people telling me who Jesus was, and I had lots of opinions of my own, but when I read the Bible, I find out who the real Jesus was. And I suppose there is also um, the possibility that people can be very precious about these particular rituals that they follow in, you know, from, from the best of motives, and yet not think about the impact that some of those rituals might be having on people who are not churched people. Um, and I do get that something with the church that I go to. We're not we're not high church at all, but we do have certain things that we do in certain kinds of ways, and it, many of them make me cringe. And I think I this, you know, this is like uh, Christianity of the 1950s, as it feels to me. But we do these things, or even the 19th sure. century, you know, with the, the great big organ that's playing mm-hmm. there. And you know, I think a lot of the people in the church do actually think, as far as they're concerned, this is this is helping them in their spiritual life. But there is this sense of disregard of of what effect that might have on somebody who's coming from you know the digital culture coming into the church and hearing the organ. Wow. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I am just a sinner. I know I am, and I've just been saved by a blo- I was drowning, and this bloke pulled me out. So none of that stuff just helped me. I haven't been helped by any of those things by paying for a new roof for a building down the road. I haven't been no. helped by a bloke wearing a dress. I haven't been helped <laughs> by you know religious appearance mm. none of that does anything to help my predicament and get me out of the water of my sins and of my nature and my problems so what did it for me was jesus <laughs> so so, sure, so i don't sure, need anything sure. else now either <laughs> <laughs> although i do notice that your album was not called jesus it was called we're not grasshoppers <laughs> i've got to know <laughs> i've got to know why you called it that well it's it's taken from that bit where uh, there's a there's a report in the old testament there's a report where the spies go into the into Canaan, which is meant to be the land that God has promised to his people. The, 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 Caleb and Joshua come back with a good report and say, yeah, okay, we're right, but there's other spies come back with a bad report and say, oh, I can't believe it. It's full of giant. We're like grasshoppers compared to the people there. They're massive. What are we going to do? And God was angry because he, he said, don't, you'll be strong in my strength. You know, you'll enter the promised land. At the time when we na- named that album, it was like for us Christians, uh, we don't need to fear the enemy and we don't need to fear entering the promised land either which is going to be heaven so from a spiritual perspective we're not grasshoppers we're giants in the lord in that respect we, we, we are in his strength kind of thing that was the idea so don't see things by appearances but who you are in christ you know yeah. that was it yeah, yeah. <laughs> it makes sense now <laughs> Yeah, no, I said, I, said, I said before, actually, um, that I really like the way that your lyrics work in the songs because you don't do that normal thing, as, as I said, you know, about singing Jesus, 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 Jesus all the time. Um, and you, your lyrics do have this really different angle where you, you seem to be challenging people's presuppositions and then leave them, as I said, with this kind of hint as to what the answer is must be which of course who of course right. is jesus i really love the way you do that and there's one song that i think you do that brilliantly with uh, and is modern man that's from your 2005 album of the same name and so we're going to hear this now and uh, then i'd love to know what it was that prompted you to write it in this kind of way so this is modern man by maccabees which was the name of the group at the time with lyrics by andy jennings <laughs>
great song great song i just wanted to comment on those lyrics you have there uh you try to rewrite history you don't believe in no truth yet you believe in evolution even though there's no proof because you're a modern man and then you have the li- <laughs> and then you have the line but you ain't nothing new i just love the way those lyrics work where you sort of define that's the problem but then it's nothing to brag about anyway <laughs> i just love the way those <laughs> lyrics work so i mean do you want to tell us more about then um what that's about and what prompted you to write it that way well uh I just think that the the modern, I don't know, I think we're crazy. We live in crazy times where actually if we did really think what we thought, we'd go mad. And I think we kind of, (laughs) the modern man is mad because you kind of like don't want to discuss things that are true and yet every day get up in the morning and consider that there are things that are true. It's a kind of insanity that if you actually thought about it, you'd explode. But because we don't think about it too much, we we get by. A bit like the existentialists that that they kind of... uh, they had their own theories and philosophies, but every morning they woke up in the morning and had their breakfast and had their cup of tea. And by that time they'd done that, they disproved their theory. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. This is actually one of the things that uh, Francis Schaeffer used to say was that people don't live according to the thing, you know, their presuppositions. And if they if they did, <laughs> he got the example of, uh, you know, that uh, avant-garde composer called John Cage. Yeah, yeah. Who uh, was very famous for writing that the, the, the silent piece of music, four minutes thirty three seconds, where you, know, you just don't do anything for whatever a length of time you like, actually. But when it was first performed, it was four minutes thirty three seconds. But John Cage also used to collect mushrooms, and he was an expert. And uh, Schaefer oh. used to say of him, well, you know, he doesn't live according to his presuppositions because he, his presupposition was that everything was random. But he didn't go collecting his mushrooms randomly because if he did. He would have died because he would have eaten lots of poisonous things. So he didn't actually live Absolutely. according to what he believed to be true, even though he was a modern man, you know, <laughs> believing those things. And I think that you're absolutely right. It's so true of many people don't actually consider what they believe to be true. Just take it for granted. And often it really doesn't make any sense. Well, I think if whatever you believe, you should know why you believe what you believe. And if you don't believe something, you should know why you don't believe it. Yeah. To me, it's insanity. It's the insanity of man to not know why you don't believe something. To me, that's just lazy. Good example you gave there. Um, it's a bit like sitting on a branch and chopping the branch off. A lot of the time, like saying, well, I think everything came about by random chance. But the person who's just told you that wants you to take their sentence as a very well-constructed and sensible statement, not random at all. Uh, so, again, you're soaring off the branch. You're just mm. sitting on you know, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot with insects. Same as people say, you know, they say, I don't believe there is no such, I want you to believe there's no such thing as absolute truth. And then they want you to believe that that statement you just said is absolutely true. Absolutely. Yes. Indeed. This is the modern man's predicament, you know, or postmodern man or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, there's nothing new. It isn't he isn't clever, the modern man. He hasn't found some special philosophy. He's basically just not one to believe in God. And he's just found a new way of not doing it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. Like, very, very good example. Well, yeah. Because that's been man's state always. Mm. He just found ways of rejecting God in the past in different ways. It might have been idolatry, worshipping another God. But there was a way of rejecting God. You know, we all find ways of rejecting God uh, in different ways. It's quite creative. Mm-hmm. And it's another one, of course, these days is where we don't have to believe in God because, of course, we're predetermined to believe whatever we believe because we don't have any free will. So there's no choice in the matter anyway. But, but, but then every decision we make throughout the day testifies to us that we do, in fact, have free will. So it really doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. man. It's uh, uh, a guy came up to me at work recently and said, oh, how can we prove that we're really here? You know, I mean, you know, because they've looked at quantum quantum theory and it kind of makes the point that you know it gets so small that certain things don't exist in in time and space or whatever you know uh, and uh he was saying there therefore we we you know we might not be here and it's very simple you just get a video camera and you film yourself saying that and then you take the video out and you stick it in your dvd player and you play it back to yourself and you, <laughs> yes. there's your evidence. Well, that, see, that seems that seems so sort of laughable but there's such a truth to that isn't there because as you say modern man can become so arrogant and, and believing that they're so sophisticated and yet you just take some sort of home truth like that which sort of pricks that completely and i think that's worth doing because as you say we, we can as yeah. human beings we can hide behind these sophistications and really it's just our pride isn't it that is trying to hide us from our creator uh, totally. And I, I know there's different ways of hiding. And, uh, and one, one of them, modern ones, is science. Everyone thinks that so there's this holy grail of science. Mm. There's these amazing scientists sitting in the corner somewhere doing science, doing amazing science with their hair sticking up in the air and little pince nez on their nose. There's just people having to try and get money to write up their theories to get them peer reviewed. 
uh, and then uh, most of science is theory. It's just hypothesis. There, well, there is a lot of corruption in science. That's for, that's for sure. But I mean, even where, the, where you have good science, and of course there is a lot of good science. Nevertheless, the uh, uh-huh. establishment, the sort of uh, the talking heads of the, <laughs> the elitist media, will try to give us the impression that all science is anti-Christian, is anti-religion. Of course, that's not true, because there are many, many scientists who are believers. But uh-huh. you hardly ever hear that. Well, the, the big irony is that most science actually took off as a result of the Bible being printed, and now people are able to have open minds. If people forget history our scientists and stuff we're all theists you know that that, that they had open minds because they believed in god they believed they were discovering what god had put there yes it was scientism they split between science and so-called faith well you know if you're a scientist you are a man of faith anyway because you have to have a theory that hasn't been proved yet therefore you have faith that it will happen or something will happen and then you find out whether it will or won't afterwards you know the definition of faith has been changed as well you know richard dawkins you read his book and he doesn't understand basically what faith is no he thinks he thinks it's just a jump into the dark doesn't he Oh, totally. He he doesn't realise that when he sits on a chair, he's exercising faith. Mm. And that's not a jump in the dark. It's reasonable. Quite. Christianity, at least my experience of Christianity, is trusting in something, well, some body, Christ, based upon not just reason, but nevertheless based upon reason. I mean, I believe that that there's good evidence that Christ actually rose from the dead. Um, You know, and I believe there's good evidence that Jesus actually existed and said the kinds of things that he said and, uh, and, you know, did the kinds of things that he did. And that testifies to who he is. And so all that can be argued, you know, as a sequence of of reasoning steps. And so therefore, it's not just a jump into the dark to believe that it's supported by one's reason. And in fact, I think that most of the, the arguments against Christianity, against real Christianity, just fall to the ground most of the time. Uh, really, they really do that. And the frustration is that there's not enough. Um, you don't get intellectual, clever Christians being given the airtime. Usually, try and find someone who doesn't know he's on about some, no. some, some, you know, some man of the cloth somewhere who who argues and probably believes in evolution anyway or something, you know. Uh, or they get someone who's just like, mouthing off and shouting. Uh, there are some really straight down the line scientists who believe in God who are Christians. Uh, there are people who understand ancient languages and ancient mythology mm-hmm. and everything who are Pentecostal Christians. You know, I know one who is ex extra university expert in ancient Sumerian Sanskrit and, and, and ancient languages that no one's touched, understands the whole Middle Eastern history. And uh, his peers just can't understand that he's actually a Pentecostal Christian. C.S. Lewis was an, uh, an Oxford Don. That's right. He, yes. he has a way of explaining things to a dummy like me, but in, in, in a very amazing way, a very clear, logical, reasonable way. And I've noticed actually in the last 10 years or so, maybe 15, 20 years, how professional philosophers of religion have actually taken very seriously what C.S. Lewis wrote. Of course, C.S. Lewis is writing in a popular context, he's writing to the, in inverted commas, ordinary person, <laughs> but in, in a very reasonable way, of course. Um, but a lot of philosophers have actually taken seriously a lot of the things that C.S. Lewis has said and worked upon them. So, I mean, the, the standard of his thought was astonishing, really. Yes, yeah, definitely, man. I mean, this song, it's basically about the fact that there is evidence there's very good evidence that God exists, you know, beyond reasonable doubt. If you don't look, you won't find. And people find a way of not finding what they don't want to find. <laughs> yeah. You know. And what, while we're on this subject of lyrics here, because I was saying that those lyrics are really capturing what we've just been talking about brilliantly. Um, I want to also talk about the economy of some of your lyrics. And this really does come out in the song Wolves, because there you have just one line really of the lyrics that you've actually written which just goes i've got to tell you that there's something wrong (laughs) but the rest of it the words are coming from other recordings and yet you comment upon those words in the recordings just with that one line so this is kind of minimalism going on here which i think is really really effective and that song particularly connects with me because it's all about the abuse of power within religious broadcasting and last year we had a couple of guests on Oli Anthony and Robert Bowman and they were both criticizing the not all televangelists but those televangelists you know the, who peddle the word of faith teaching that kind of thing which of course is that unbiblical idea that the Christian life must always be victorious with material success and happiness you know everything you want and your song really gets to the heart of this one as I say by using these recordings of some of these teachers themselves and you kind of get them to condemn themselves actually don't you yeah so I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us how, how you hit upon that idea and why are you singing about that well I mean it, it, uh, it it's devastating really these guys have kind of applied their trade amongst the, uh, the Christian world and uh, a lot of people have uh, pied pipers who've taken the children away it's, it's a bit like when Jesus 
had to drive out the money changers and stuff in the temple. We all know about that story. And uh, they were making money out of the blood of lambs. You know, the whole the whole system, they turned something that was a place of prayer and a place of dedication. And that precious blood, you know, that covered people's sins, as if you were an Old Testament Jew, that was serious. And these guys were making money out of it. Well, today you have a modern day version of it. Smiley white, white teeth and nice suits and stuff. And they're basically making money out of the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God. And, uh, oh, that's just so serious. I mean, I can get cross about all sorts of things in the world, but this is serious because this is in Jesus' name. It's horrible, you know. And uh, one thing that really upsets me is that they've been allowed to kind of minister to the sheep, to Christians, yeah. to come into churches. And that makes me question about the shepherds. Because the understanding in the Old Testament of sheep and shepherds is that the, the shepherd would lie over the gate. He would be the gate. No wolf, no bear, no lion, no tiger would enter into the sheep, uh, except over his dead body. He, he gave his life for those sheep. And that's what the picture we get with Jesus. He's the good shepherd. And I wonder about some of the guys and who've allowed these wolves into the ministry of the Christian church to basically rip people off, take money from them just so they can pay the fuel bills on their private jets and things. Yeah, and in fact, on your your record cover there, you have a picture of a some kind of minister standing there with his hands yeah. outstretched with a wolf's head that you've put on there. It's really effective. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's so upsetting because, you know, a lot of people would see this who aren't Christians and think, oh, that's Christianity in the nutshell. There you go. All right, so we're not into the old mothball religion side, but then this is meant to be the real thing, the guys who are like, you know, salesmen. And again, another error. I mean, Jesus did say that there would be lots of deception in the last days, be false teachers and false prophets. And so we have to flag them up. And there's a lot of people who say you shouldn't flag these things up. You should be gracious to Mr. Wolf. And if you are not really nice to Mr. Wolf, you will be told off. It's a bit like standing up to the bully in the playground. You know, if you stand up to the bully in the playground, people turn on the person who stands up against the bully rather than the bully because of the status quo sh- shaken a bit. These wolves sound like the real thing because they do speak about Jesus a lot. They speak about the gospel but there's like a kind of deadly bit of arsenic in the sandwich and it's this added teaching that they have which sends everything off now jesus really did castigate the religious people of his time some of them for adding to what god had already said like moses and that's it and they added their own things to it that's people right. thought oh, that's not a problem never mind but nothing wrong with adding a bit but jesus said that by adding you know you've made the word of god void and so these guys have added their little bit of extra doctrine, which is like, the, oh, you know, you claim it in the name of Jesus. You know, he'd use his name like a kind of genie name or a like kind of talisman or special magic oh. word and claim things in his name. And, uh, of course, they've sold their kind of teaching to people, a lot of poor people mainly. And they, what it does is it appeals to greed. And what they've defined faith as is greed. So they're appealing to the human greed that's in our hearts. For more yeah. money if you give to me you'll get 10 bolt back or something like that this is incredible isn't it they have this sort of seed faith doctrine where people actually sow seeds by paying lots of money into whatever ministry it is and the more they pay in the more god is going to bless them that just strikes me as just really wicked teaching to be honest because as you say it targets those people who are the most needy so they're giving out of what they That's really right. can't afford to give and, and hoping that, that god's going to bless them when god actually wants to bless them anyway by being in a relationship with that person and yet they're being abused by this teacher and and giving money they haven't got so this teacher as you say can yeah, put some yeah. extra fuel in their private jet it's, it really is yeah, appalling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah i mean it is what it is it isn't that complicated it, it does exactly what it says on the on, on the tin mm-hmm. but unfortunately many people have fallen hook line and sinker for it it's a real shame and yeah i've, I've had friends who've been involved in it and tried to get them out of it i've had experiences where i've been to things and these these guys have been there and the, a lot of it's associated with signs and wonders and miracles people are bought off by the signs and miracles a lot of the time because they're wowed by that and go, oh, Jesus refused to put on a show. And I always bring everything down to Jesus. What's he like? Uh, and he's nothing like these guys. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Indeed, yeah. It's just not. Yes. It's just two different poles apart. And the apostles and nothing like this. They didn't do any of this. In fact, in fact, it's nothing new under the sun. You know, a lot of the New Testament is written to confront the same thing happening way back in Paul's time. Paul actually said that there were these guys called super apostles who were actually preaching the gospel for own, their own personal gain, whatever that meant. Mm. 
Jesus said that the Son of Man, of course he's referring to himself there, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know, which just gives the impression that he really was oh. wandering around a lot of the time in, you know, out in the open, not always having somewhere to, to rest. Well, that's the complete opposite of having a, a massive mansion that's worth, you know, five million dollars or whatever it is. Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, I do think that God is giving them what they want, but it's not God. It's the God of this world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who is Satan? Jesus said the God of this world, the cosmos, this current order, this current system. Is Satan himself, and so he does reward. False teachers do get their rewards, but they don't get them from God's provision, Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth. And so, yeah, I, I've had to deal with it, to do it with friends. I had, I had to, oh, you know, I, I could tell you lots of stories, but um, it, it, it's very upsetting. It's one of many upsetting things, and, and a lot of them have a theology of kingdom now, which is the idea that you know now we're the king's kids, and that we're going to take the earth for Jesus and stuff. And Jesus said the opposite. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. But ah, that's only what Jesus said. Let's ignore yes. that and let's, <laughs> let's say something else. You know, I'm sorry. No, Jesus is the Lord. He's the guy. He's the one we should listen to. And he said, my kingdom's not of this world. He said, drink this cup and have this until I see you again. I'll, I won't drink it with you until I come again in my kingdom. So his kingdom's coming, but his kingdom's not here. The only sense in which his kingdom's here is if it's in our hearts. We as Christians experience that on a one-to-one -one thing, but the world is not full of Jesus' kingdom. It's not. It's uh, it's not as it should be. So it will be when he comes. Indeed, and uh, this idea that somehow the world is going to be Christianized in some way oh, yeah. before Christ returns. I mean, this is uh, quite a deception there, isn't it, waiting to happen? Because, you know, how can that be manipulated? Uh, one wonders. Well, actually, I do wonder if as a result of this, because actually a lot of people have this theology, kingdom now, they'll actually end up actually helping the uh, Antichrist come to power. They might actually end up being part of the problem. You know, and you don't want to do that, do you? I agree. I think that is a, re a very real possibility that that sort of thing could happen with this faulty kind of way of looking at things, yeah. Which is not really based upon Scripture. It's throwing Scripture aside, really, isn't it? It is. I mean, the main message that I see coming through, and about 23% the New Testament is prophecy and talks about last days mm. and things that will happen. So I guess it's important. And um, I, I do think that we should be heavenly minded. We should be looking because Jesus said, you know, he's like the bridegroom. And if you understand the Hebrew, the, the Jewish wedding system and pattern, then we're the, we're the bride, people who are believers in Jesus. Mm. And he's coming back to take us because that's what happens with the bridegroom goes on, a, goes to build a house, uh, an extra building in his dad's house. And then he comes and his dad says, right, go and get her. And she has to just be ready after about a year or whatever. And he, she doesn't know what time is coming. And then he comes to get her. And then he takes her to be where he's prepared for her. So really, Christians should be thinking about getting out of here because this world is not their home in this current state. That's my view anyway. That's how I understand mm. Scriptures use the uh, the image of the new heavens and the new earth, don't they, or the new Jerusalem. So we're actually looking for heaven and earth to be united at some point in future when Christ returns. And so that is most emphatically right. not this order of things that we're experiencing now. So the idea that somehow yeah. this world is gradually going to be spiritualized in a rather positive way goes quite against that idea that Christ one day will return dramatically and change everything. <laughs> yeah. to totally, man, yeah. Basically, I mean, I don't know where you come from with this, but my understanding is that there's a millennium. It doesn't say the word millennium in the Bible. It says a uh, thousand years, <laughs> which is, is yeah. a millennium, that Jesus is going to reign on the planet Earth for that amount of time. It's going to be a, a thing set up in Jerusalem. It's going to be a heavenly Jerusalem and whatever. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get into details. I'm not sure about that, but I know he's coming. Oh, well, I, I agree. I, I have to say, I, I don't fully understand the millennium. I've looked into it for a while, but I, I became, you know, I reached a point of, of saying, well, I, I really don't know about this. And maybe, you know, maybe information in future will shift my opinion on this. But what I did settle on was that this isn't going to happen until Christ returns. That bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth um, right. is, is going to happen not yeah. before Christ returns, whatever sequence there might be between the, the second coming and whatever ultimately happens. Nevertheless, right. it's not going to happen this side of the yeah. of the parousia. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about these sort of movements towards a, you know, a one world church and all these things. I think, well, you know, this is this is a deception. This is the idea that we're going to set up a kingdom of God on earth and it's not going to be because the, the scripture is actually written against it yeah that's it but that's not that's not very sexy is it it's not very palatable you know oh we want to have stuff now we want it to be all going that's good right. and that's the flesh that's just i mean of course we'd like everything to be hunky-dory but we have a master who's told us 
how it is yeah. <laughs> and how it's going to be. And we're not in control. We just love to be in control, wouldn't we? That's right. Yeah. So, but I'm looking forward so much to just being with him. But hey, I'm with him now by his Holy Spirit, by his spirit. I've got a relationship with him now, but I really look forward to seeing him in my flesh with a new body, an upgraded, glorified body that will never die or get ill. It's, you know, it's pretty cool. But that I think is interesting because when I think about what's happening now on Earth now, what people are doing, what man is trying to strive for without God, he's messing with science. Have you, I don't know if you know about transhumanism or post-humanism. Ray Kurzweil and people like that are talking about They're talking about uh, human 2.0 eradicating all sorts of aging issues and stuff like that. This is a kind of bringing a, a, a kind of human version of resurrection into being, isn't it? That's it. So it's it's resurrection, mm. but not glorified resurrection. And resurrection still with a sin nature. What Jesus gives you, he gives you a new body, You get, but it's uh, without sin, and it will never perish and die. Which do you want to take? Absolutely. And the, the, you, 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 that little thing you said, never perish and die. But even with the sort of Kurzweil kind of view of things, even if you could have yourself, you know, uploaded onto some massive computer or whatever to live forever, you're not going to live forever because the universe itself, even on an atheistic reading, isn't going to last forever. No. There are different scenarios as to how the universe would end were, you know, there to be no God. <laughs> and, and in each yeah. of those scenarios, the universe does end. It either, you know, it either yeah. just ends up as a cold soup or it collapses in on itself or it gets ripped apart, whatever. One of those is in view there. So it's not eternal life by any stretch of the imagination. That That's right. And so that's what we're up against. And, uh, you know, it's so good to know that God is good and in the end he wins. Uh, but he's given us all free will mm. to choose not him or him yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i was an enemy i was a rebel and i was against god now i'm an enemy and a rebel against the god of this world and i love jesus <laughs> <laughs> you know i've changed sides yeah yeah well that's great and we're going to turn to that song that i was talking about where you really do comment in, in this really as i said economic way upon all those false teachings that are there which of course are not <laughs> they're not on god's side they may sound like they're on god's side but they really aren't uh, many oh. many of them certainly the ones that you pick out there as, as examples and as i say you just comment with this one line and i think it's really well done it says it all really so this is wolves by dissident prophet hunters, these guys who spend their lives straightening us all out doctrinally, they're going to go straight to hell. They're going to absolutely... <laughs> Several people that I know have criticized. Some of them are dead right today in an early grave because of it, and there's more than one of them got cancer. Let me say something else, too, and I really don't care if you like this or not. You have attacked me, your children will pay for it. And I love Popeye. He's my friend. And anybody who's attacking him is attacking the very presence of God.
in the Bible, I just can't seem to find it. One verse that said, if you don't like him, kill him. I really wish I could find it. You think, frankly, that's the way I think about it. I'm sorry, I'm not exactly the normal kind of guy, you know. I'm from Israel. Sometimes I wish God give me a Holy Ghost machine gun. I'll blow your head off. I am a little guy. I have his name. I'm one with him. I'm in covenant relation with him. I am a little God. Frederick, you are anything that he is. something. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. God, the Father, cannot do anything in this earth without permission. Jesus wore designer clothes. Yeah, it's a nice one. <laughs> now, I, I want to turn now uh, specifically to the music, the musical language, really, of the band. When I first went to Distant Prophet's Facebook page, I was really quite amazed by the sheer variety of musical influences that you list there, because you've got there Lou Reed, Larry Norman, David Bowie, Ramones, 70s messianic band Lamb, Velvet Underground, The Motels, Television, Blondie, Gang of Four, Talking Heads, The Stooges, and even Vince the Milkman. You're going to have to explain who Vince the Milkman is. And uh, just off the top of my head, you know, The Jam, The Clash, Gary Newman, Elvis Costello, Blur, all the dozens of other things seem to be in there. And on your, your main web page, you've got this really enigmatic description that Distant Prophet is, and I'm going to quote this, right, apocalyptic rhubarb new wave punk. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to know what rhubarb is as well. So who's Vince the Milkman and what's rhubarb? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> well... All right, Vince the Milkman for a start. Let's just let's deal with Vince. It, it mentions him as being an influence, like in the music. But actually, on our album sleeve for 21st Century Spin, we have a lot of influences on that. We, we say thank you to the United Nations, the Lucis Trust, Alice Bailey, to Tony Blair, and, and loads of people that are really dodgy. Right? Wonderful. Yes. And, and in there we have, and thanks to uh, Vince the Milkman, somewhere in the middle, somewhere. So basically, we just put him in there with the influences of the music as well, because uh, he deserves it. He it was a nice guy. Yeah, and he was just your milkman, was just, he? Just the milkman. That's it, really. <laughs> See, because the strange thing is, I actually went to the great rock discography, which I've got sitting here, <laughs> trying to find Vince the Milkman. I was convinced <laughs> that it's got to be the that's got to be the title of a, of a punk band from the seventies. <laughs> so you got me. Ah. <laughs> uh. Tell you what, now I think we should do a side side project now and just call it Vince the Milkman. Yeah. I think that'd be great. Got a, we've got a load of songs that don't actually really fit the Distant Prophet thing. Just silly things, like silly songs about silly little things. You've got a great Columbo one, haven't you, somewhere? Well, yeah, that's a silly one, just messing around. I like Columbo and uh, just like his uh, his uh, phrases and stuff. And he kept saying, I love that bit where he says, uh, when, when uh, Alistair McGowan says, is there anything else I can get for you, Columbo? And he goes, I love a fresh pair of socks. 
<laughs> and you keep using that. You keep throwing that back in. That's great. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you should put that in your wolves one. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. That, oh yeah. Okay. Then we'll do a remix. <laughs> So go on then, do you want to talk about some of those influences then with all this different music that you seem to, you know, pull out of everywhere really and you put it together in a, a new way? I mean, you really do remind me of Blur actually in that way. So, you know, what are these influences? Well, um, uh, yeah, uh, just love loads of new wave music, <laughs> all that kind of music you just listed and loads more. I absolutely love it. It's my favourite music. Uh, I suppose I missed out on, I was too young to kind of really get into Bowie in the 70s because I was too young, but uh, I got him in, into him later you know, through friends and college and stuff. And, and uh, my wife, she's a bit older than me. And she, she, she's, she, she even went to see Bowie and Bowling and stuff. So she, she was into that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I just love, I grew up, I grew up with new wave stuff. Uh, first gig I went to was uh, the jam. No, no, no. The undertones it was at, at the Odeon in Birmingham. I was 11 years old and it was just like, Oh, this is great. This is this is it. This is I love this music. And then uh, next gig was the jam, and then from that onwards, that point onwards, I was, yeah, that was it. I was really into it. So quite from a very early age, all that stuff. It could be you know, Elvis Costello, uh, Blondie, The Cars, or any everything from that period. It was a, it, to me, it was a really exciting explosion yeah. of good music uh, and lots of new bands that were kind of doing their own thing. It wasn't necessarily massive record company stuff, but it was it was really creative stuff. I mean, I recently went to see the uh, Beefy Twos in Birmingham and supporting them was um, the members who did that song, Sound of the Suburbs. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> and that was great, that was. They were just as good. They were all just like old men, but like, uh, yeah. you know, it's great music, love all that kind of stuff. So uh, and that, so that's it. That's basically informed my style, my mm. kind of music mm. uh, generally. And my friend Tom's the same. Uh, my wife's the same. So we all like that kind of music and we happen to be Christians. So that's kind of what you get. Yeah. So, so yeah. What what intrigues me about this then is what do you actually do? Do you just you just have ideas and it just happens to be that your ideas fit into those styles, or sort of subconsciously, or do you actually consciously say, well, yeah, I think I'm going to pick out some sort of technique from this band and a technique from that band and and juxtapose them or put them in different lines together? How do you work about this? What it is, you've got so much of that in you mm. that it just comes out. Uh, you know, when you pick your guitar up or whatever and do a riff or something, or you have an idea in your head, you don't think, oh, no, I want to do something a bit like uh, fashion off Scary Monsters or something, you know, or I want to do something like Bowie did then. It, mm. you, you do want to do that, but you don't think that kind of technically and that straight, that kind of obviously. So mm. it, it kind of comes out because you like all that music and I want to express myself and I've got like uh, I've got things I want to say and they wouldn't really sound good in a ballad. Like, so if I'm writing a song at the moment called OBE, Outcome Based Education. I mean, that's a subject about education, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> my wife's a teacher. You know? Yeah. So it's not going to be like a ballad. <laughs> <laughs> that idea has a kind of spiky kind of feel to it, you know. Oh, God, beast. <laughs> education. <Right. laughs> I'm thinking like that in my head. So yeah. I'm thinking, ah, oh, I'm thinking talking heads or, uh, you know. XTC or something. XTC, <laughs> well, XTC, there you go. That was Andy Partridge, wasn't it? So, so it comes out of you when you're thinking of the me- the kind of feel of the song. What what kind of feel would suit those words, those spiky words, or those thoughts in your head? Yeah, so that natu- naturally comes to you, yeah. And yeah. you just draw from any of those styles. I mean, you don't just sort of, ah, okay, I've got an XTC thing going on here, and then you come out sounding like XTC. You don't. There's some aspect of it sounds no. like that, and then some aspect will sound like something else. It just It's great the way that those things just... But they all sound like Dissident Prophet in the end, which is what I think is so great about the band, musically. Great stuff, great stuff, because we're not kind of trying to sound yeah. like Dissident Prophet, but... I think, like you say, we've got the luxury of what of of doing it because we're not signed and trying. Well, we're not in the big record company or something where you have to have a market and you will be this market, Coldplay, or you'll be this, or you know, it's yeah. just great to be able to do music that you just want to do. So uh, you, you'll do it, and you might jiggery poker it about, or change it a bit, or redo it because you think, oh, I've listened to that now, and I want it to sound a bit more like Talking Heads or something, you know. But you don't start off saying I want it to sound like Talking Heads. You know, it's in the production that it starts to sound a bit like other things. Death by Entertainment, for example, that that was influenced by Talking Heads, uh, the, the, the the kind of edginess to it, and Bit 52s with the oh, those influences are just in there. 
because I've listened to all that music and like it all, like everything. I like loads of music. I like ELO. I like stuff that isn't new wave. But the thing about that Death by Entertainment song there is that you got you really do juxtapose really different things, don't you? It just suddenly sort of changes from one style to another really effectively. Yeah, I think basically you mustn't have too many. It's good to have rules with songwriting and then to break them a bit. Mm. We've just written a song called The Word about Jesus being the word. And it isn't really a song, but it, it works. So sometimes you just, if you think, oh, I want to write a song, it just doesn't work. You know, you're just trying to write a song. I really wish I understood it, but it's just, that I, I think often you have a lot of songs going at once. You could have five songs in your mind and they're like little projects in your head that just keep uh-huh. going and then you just leave them and then you, you might come back to it later while you're walking around somewhere or doing something at work or something. So, so you try things out in your head or ideas and stuff. And it's just a real joy and pleasure to get together with your best mates and work it out and it's just like it always seems to kind of be enjoyable you obviously do a song sometimes it, it, it doesn't work and you think oh, i drop it you have to be you have to be quite critical yeah i noticed you've got uh, a few songs i don't know where you have them stored somewhere but they're, they're available they're online somewhere but you, they're not part of an album i don't know whether they're songs where you've done that and said oh we're going to shelve that or whether they're sort of works in progress that you're yeah. going to put in albums in future i don't know we've written loads of songs and 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 uh, stuff from the past that's never been heard and stuff and they're, they're quite good songs you know and then, yeah yeah you've got one about the garden of gethsemane i can't remember the title of it but that's a really good song actually yes uh, and that's just not on, on any album or anything like that and we kind of felt we need to, we wanted to do it again just so it would be fit mm. onto an album so we'll probably do that for the next album after this next one so we're very we just keep writing songs so it just keeps going and going at the moment anyway so. yeah great stuff now you were mentioning death by entertainment there as uh, an example of this and you brought up what was it uh, talking heads and the b-52s were the two things that you brought out with that particular song this is a song off your modern man album again from 1996 so let's hear that and uh, maybe it will jog you to say something else about it
I really love the way you have that sudden sort of like full on guitar there and you change the you know you change the tempo and you have all that sort of chromatic thing going on. But <laughs> <laughs> what, what <laughs> how, how come how come that works? How can you move from one style to the other just just like that and it works? You just decide to do it. You just go, I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna do it. I don't know. It, 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 you can do some songs where you just change the timing as well and change the speed. You can do it. It's like it's a weird. I don't know. You just try it and see if it works. You go, oh, that's all right. That that though that works. <laughs> so you just do you just experiment and it, you're just using the influences that are there but it's not conscious but i was i was asking yeah. you though can you see any other styles in that song that you're influenced by there was a little bit of kaiser chiefs just with the guitar ah. you know so it's a bit of a modern influence i mean i like bands like that mm. because they're very much i mean kaiser chiefs is the modern day xtc isn't it and uh and franz ferdinand's the modern day i don't know gang of four or something like that you know they, 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 we've got our modern versions of those of those bands yeah and the, in the lyrics here you've got this uh you know it's keep this is entertainment it's keeping you and me from thinking about eternity walking down the wide road which is a very straight full-on message there but you also have some sort of things there that trigger deeper reflection as well you have a conspiracy of interruptions it's keeping you and me from asking questions hollywood is on a mission yeah. let it slowly eat your children mm-hmm. bow down to the television yeah death by entertainment really sums it up uh, i think that uh we're living in amazing times, prophetically, as a Bible believer, very close to the return of Jesus, seeing prophecy being revealed and fulfilled. I certainly understand things that are happening in the Middle East, but I also see with the technology and communication thing going on, like prophecies that are in Daniel, where it says that increase of knowledge and understanding. And yet there's a conspiracy almost to keep people dumbed down, dulled, not aware of what's going on. Uh, and entertainment's a great way of doing that. Just keep the masses, you know, give them their opium. Marx said that religion was the opium for the people, but nowadays it's changed. It's the opium is entertainment for the people, and it will just keep, yeah. them, keep them humming over. I mean, we're all like that. I'm like that. I love tennis, for example. I follow Andy Murray around the world. You know, that's my thing. You know, we've all got something we can get waylaid by. Uh, entertainment was but you do use that word conspiracy which is uh, very interesting because obviously that's something we've been talking about on the podcast a lot and of course it's a very meaningful word but it's really very much misused these days and uh, you know it leads me to ask about another thing that you do through the songs you you do engage with people's concerns about various conspiracies that are indeed going on in the world and uh, you you identify those as you say as foretold in biblical prophecy and of course i'm thinking here of things like you know the moves towards a new world order the breaking down national sovereignty this sort of cashless society biometric technology all this sort of thing and you as i say you identify those as things as being in essence prophesied in the bible and you do draw people's attention to that through the lyrics and in the moment i want to play that song of yours revelation 13 16 which of course locates chapter 13 of the book of revelation that really warns us about these kinds of developments before i actually play that you mentioned in your testimony that you came across these kinds of ideas before you were a Christian and that they they sort of played some kind of role in your yeah. coming to faith in Christ. And that's that's really interesting because, um, yeah. you know, I, I think that these kinds of uh, things that are, are going on do present us with an opportunity to share the gospel. And so many people seem to miss that that is an opportunity for us. Anyway, h- how did you come across these ideas? How did they fit into your coming to Christ? Well, first of all, I met a guy called Kenny at college many, many years ago, five or six years before I actually became a Christian. He was a lovely Christian guy, big smile on his face, talked about Jesus all the time. And he talk, spoke to my friend and I, and he said, uh, could he tell me the gospel in the canteen at college? He just went through a simple tract and explained that we were cut off from God because of sin and God is perfect and righteous. And he provided a perfect answer for that, which was that he had become a man and he'd created the, the bridge between us and, and God by actually dying for us, paying for our sins, so that we could therefore be made righteous and therefore be brought back to relationship with God. Really simple. That was the gospel. But he also gave me a book, and it was all about the fulfillment of prophecies regarding technology. And this was way back before they had chip and pin. This was just when like credit cards were just about starting to come on the scene. And it was talking all about the future mark of the beast, which the book of Revelation 13, 16 talks about. And I'd never heard anything like this. And it just like blew my mind. I thought, whoa. That's just in the Bible, nowhere else. And he said, no, no, it's just in the Bible. And I said, that made me have an idea that, wow, prophecy? I never knew that stuff was in the Bible. You know, I only knew the Sunday school stories, mm. you know. But this was real nuts and bolts stuff about reality and the mm. world we live in. And that cr- gave the Bible credence and started to give Jesus credence in my mind and the idea of it being true. So that was a start. Then... Many years later, uh, I went to Nashville where my sister was staying and I spent some time there. And then I I ended up going to a a fundraiser in Nashville, this big church thing there. 
My sister didn't pick me up till like three o'clock in the morning. She'd forgot about it. And I ended up staying behind with just one guy in this huge, massive building, an auditorium uh, called Jim. He was the caretaker there. And he told me his testimony. He'd been a heroin addict and a heroin dealer in Detroit, gone to prison, lost his family, messed his life up, everything. While he was in prison, he got saved, became a Christian, was delivered of all sorts of things. And his life was changed and he got this job. He told me, he says, hey, come with me, I'll show you something. And he showed me some research he'd been looking into. And it was all about Washington, D.C. and the Pentagon and how it had been laid out according to occultic principles and I'd never heard of any of this stuff before. He says, yes, you've, you've seen the thing on the dollar where it says, in God we trust, and America and all that. It's a Christian country. It says, well, look at this. This is actually satanic. This is actually really Luciferian. And uh, that's here in America. So don't go thinking it's all rosy. And that, that, that really hit me. And he also showed me the dollar where you've got the pyramid on the back of the dollar with the eye at the top, which, of course, is basically in our culture everywhere now. But way back then, this was just fringe. This was, this was No one had heard of this. And that really made me start to think, oh, there seems to be a devil. There seems to be dark side and they're in this world. And it made me start thinking, well, wow. it's just around about the time of the Gulf War, first time, 1991. And I started reading a bit of the book of Revelation. Didn't quite understand, didn't understand it, but uh, I knew there was something in it. And it just got me thinking. I started reading a bit more. Of the so Bible. it was actually important for you then to read that part and, and realize that it, it does actually relate to what's going on today. Because I mean, I was oh, just, yeah. I was as you were speaking there, I was reflecting on the fact that our lectionary that we use in the church, a lectionary is a collection of scriptures, and the idea is that you work through the Bible each year with various scriptures, and these things are preached on. So it's a kind of guide as to what to preach on. And I remember that looking through that lectionary, this particular part of the Book of Revelation is not included. It's excluded. From the election so it hardly ever if ever gets preached on and thinking about what you're wow. saying there that it's actually very important for people to hear that and to make the connections with the things that are going on that is a that's a terrible shame that people are actually missing out on the opportunity there to find a sort of a doorway into the gospel well i think from a spiritual perspective the enemy knows the book of revelation is the game breaker and somehow in one way or another through all sorts of teachings mm. in seminaries and all sorts of things he's managed to get the church to just go nowhere near it they th it's all controversial we'll all end up arguing well hey if you're in anything to do with jesus there's going to be controversy Absolutely, yes you're not in, we're not in for a smooth ride and these things have to be worked through and worked out you know the book of revelation is the revelation of jesus christ and he actually says at the beginning of the book there's a special blessing for anyone who reads this prophecy and a very serious issue if you add or take away from it. So why would he say that? And then we go, I'll tell you what, we'll ignore that then. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. But I know for a fact that in any of the churches I preach, and even some of the you know the most faithful churches, if I were to get up and preach on Revelation 13, there would be a lot of raised eyebrows. But that's nuts. Unfortunately. Well, I must do it sometime. <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely nuts. I went to this church recently, this uh, kind of like uh, reform church and uh, with my daughter and uh, one of the pastors there just, he stood up and he basically preached on the whole of Revelation for a few Sundays. And then he had allowed for a question and answer thing at the end. He, there was no he, he, he was mocking the idea that this is an actual mark that's going to go on the hand or the forehead. It's purely symbolism. It's purely just the state ruling and stuff. It's all this kind of stuff. And I just had to I couldn't resist. I just put my hand up and I says, if by any chance at some point in the future there is a little chip or a mark put on the right hand or on the forehead, do you think it'll just be a coincidence? <laughs> but to make the point, because there was people there, students and stuff, who needed to realise that there is an alternative view, which is that actually it could be literal. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, I agree with you. It could be. I'm actually not convinced that it necessarily will be, but I do agree with you yeah. that it could be, and yeah. I think people should be aware of that. Certainly, absolutely. I mean, my, I think as I've said in other programs, my own view of is that it's, it, it may well be an indication of the phylactery, you know, worn on the head and on the hand and as, as an indication of your allegiance. And so your allegiance then will be to an ungodly system, which would involve, of course, you know, buying and selling. Unless your your allegiance is to this system, you can't take part in economic life. So the, the aspect of it is certainly very much yeah. there. But I do maintain that it could indeed have a literal fulfillment. So the idea of actually poo-pooing that and saying, oh, no, that couldn't possibly be anything to do with uh, implants or barcodes or anything, I think is very foolish because, yes, it could be. We don't know how it's going to be fulfilled in detail. You know, it has to be said there is a certain level of ambiguity in prophetic writings, but that doesn't mean that we should 
either say it's definitely going to be this or definitely not going to be this because as you say the indications in the text are that it could be read that way it could be read that there is actually going to be some kind of physical mark that's put on people and if that's within the you know the the ambit of possible interpretations then uh, what are we doing to say oh no you can't think along those lines because if it turns out to be that way then people are not going to be primed they're not going to be ready yeah. for, for this in order to resist it well, that's right. I mean, it does make a point, doesn't it, that you won't be able to buy or sell anything unless you have it. I mean, that's really clear. Oh, it is. Yes, there's yeah. no doubt it's going to be buying into a system in some way that's ungodly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think as we see in the in the prophetic scriptures, we just see a very a more clar- a clarification of which side you're on. Throughout time, people have always chosen whether they love God or not. But in the in the end times, I think things become revealed in a more clear way. And I would so I would say when it's like okay everybody mm. take this mark it's like that would be a really clear thing because if you've listened to Jesus in the book of Revelation and he said don't take it you know refuse the mark you know then then you know um, not to take it so your allegiance is to Jesus and because you, you love him uh, and it, it becomes things will become very stark yeah and the, the, I think the whole point about revelation and persecution and things like that is that it reveals what's the truth the truth is always the truth and people belong where they belong and have their allegiances one way or another but these things reveal it, the light, it brings it to light where people stand. And that's what I find with the book of Revelation. It seems like it's a revelation of Jesus Christ and his revelation reveals the darkness. It reveals the history of time. It reveals yes. men's hearts. Yes. And I think at the end of time, God is going to be seen to be just. Right now he's in the dark. He's accused by ranting atheists and stuff and all sorts of people uh, of being this and that. But he's sitting in the dark and the Books will be opened, and at the end of the time, God will be seen to be just and loving and merciful and gracious and true. And when all the railing accusations have come, people will know that the enemy, Satan, is not, that he's a liar. But he's going to get his time where people will actually see him as the liberator, Mm. you know. And because of that revelation that's there, it gives you the opportunity to warn people, as you do with these lyrics. You say, they know where you're shopping. With a barcode for your name, the universal product code is coming to your head. But if you don't like it, then don't get excited. They can take your hand instead. I mean, that should make anybody's, you know, hairs on the back of their neck stand on end. You know, some of this stuff is coming to pass. Got to be aware that this could actually go in that direction. So let's um, hear that song now. This is from your 2002 album, 21st Century Spin, uh, which is a fantastic cover up for this. You've got an ostrich with its head in the sand. It's wonderful. Uh, So this is the song Revelation 1316.
I guess it's something that must have very much alerted you to this spiritual dimension to the New World Order that you know we've just been talking about, really. Was your experience at various times in your life of demonic activity, by which you know I would mean spiritual entities that are against God's purposes? Could you share with us what those experiences were and what kind of impact they had on you? Well, yes, because I'd, I'd, I'd always uh, thought... If I saw anything spiritual like that, a ghost or something or some manifestation or something, I'd always said in my heart, you know, I'd believe in Jesus as well. And uh, kind of said that to myself in a way, I'd believe the rest. Uh, but I'd never seen mm. anything, so I was just agnostic in that respect. But I went to college. When I was at college, I was studying graphic design, st- staying in halls of residence, a place called Stourbridge. And it was a place called The Mere. And it had been a, thir- it had been a, a turn of the century. Uh, in 1901, it was. It was built uh, a workhouse. It had then been turned into a mental asylum. And then after that, it had been turned into halls of residence for students. When I went there, it was a pretty strange place that people were talking about that had visions of things and seen things and stuff. I still didn't believe anything. But one one night, a band came and played a gig. We used to have, there was a venue there, and a band called, called Suicide Blonde came along and played a gig. And then they'd stayed over. And while they'd stayed over, they'd made a Ouija board uh, out of cardboard, and the, the cleaners found it the next day. Uh, after that, the place kicked off. There was phenomena all over the place. And I'm an agnostic. And suddenly, strange things are happening. I'm waking up with the sound of crashing ceramic pots right by my ear. And there's nothing there. <laughs> my roommate and I are sitting in the room. And we both hear a boy crying. as if he's just there. Oh, that's interesting. So not just you, other people as well. No, so it wasn't just subjective. Yeah. It was objective because more than one person at the same time people having all sorts of experiences of scratching and stuff coming from the cupboards and things. And it's all the kind of stuff you get, think of in Scooby-Doo and things. But uh, there was one point when we were all standing in the kitchen downstairs uh, making cheese on toast. And it wasn't strong cheese, so don't put it down to that. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and there was probably about 10 of us, and uh, we all saw a spectre go through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> 10 of you saw that, yeah. Yeah. So, and we all went, woo, flip. And um, then a girl got rolled out of her bed while her boyfriend was in bed with her. And that was in a room where previously six years before a woman had hung herself from the door. So this was just weird stuff. I mean, it wasn't just the white socks, the white pullovers and the white sheets with little holes in them to go missing. It was other stuff. It was I was genuinely spooked. Yeah, the sound of it was quite unpleasant stuff. I mean, you did you didn't you didn't make you want to go to the Ouija board yourself then? No, no. Previously, when, when I was a kid, we went on a skiing trip with the school, and I remember they had this one. Had this one of this seance. Let's have a seance, you know, to lift the table up with the knees and stuff and all that kind of thing. And and we had a mess around. And then I remember this one girl. She was a Romanian, and she said, "Oh, I know how to do this. We've done this in the family." And, that. and we went, "Oh, cool," you know. We were only young. I was only about thirteen. And I remember she did it, and she told people to think of someone that had died. And uh, it was weird because this girl had actually. Um, seen her grandmother's mother's face on this boy in the other side of the room and then the glass in in the in the door just shattered <laughs> so that was something as a kid that i witnessed and and then the, i remember the coach drivers that were staying with us were furious they came in they went absolutely mad at us saying you don't know what you're messing with so i witnessed, witnessed that but moving ahead back to being a grown-up mm. and stuff yeah this kind of thing happened and it just made me really intrigued actually experiencing these things in a way i would say the enemy satan made a mistake he kind of showed his cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it didn't drive you to the Ouija board; it drove you towards Christ. Uh, I did a little bit of ghost hunting. Went down to places and to castles and places and stuff in Sherborne with the with people on the summer holidays, and we just went. But yeah, you know, didn't find anything because didn't need to because it was all happening back where we were anyway. <laughs> so a, a bit of interest spiked an interest in the spiritual realm. But by then, I mm. you know I'd met Tom, who's who's a Christian. I'd had these experiences in in America and. 
I was more interested in Jesus. And my roommate, he was a, he'd been a Mormon missionary and he'd come out of the Mormons. Uh, we were good, really good friends. And uh, but I used to ask him about. It. I was really interested, but he didn't want to tell me anything about it. I went to his temple and stuff in Merthyr and stuff at one point, and he, he just didn't want to talk to me. He'd had some bad experiences himself with demonic activity when he was actually a, a missionary in Scotland, and they they went to this house which had had some uh, evil uh, presence in it, and they couldn't do anything about it. The prayer that the Mormons had given them to deal with it just didn't work, and they ended up running fearfully from the house. Apparently, that's what he'd said anyway. So this was an aspect of life I'd, I'd just never witnessed and seen before, and uh, mm. this was real. These, these were actually manifestations I did experience. Yeah, so, so so what it did then was to open up to you the reality of the supernatural world That's right, as a yeah. totality, not not asking the question of whether it's good or evil, but just knowing that there is some evidence here that there is a supernatural world, which then presumably added credence to the, the Christian gospel. That's right, yes. That's, that's it. Yeah, you've got, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose it brings up these questions like, you know, where people say, oh, well, there couldn't possibly be a, a resurrection because miracles don't happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You suddenly realize, well, no, actually, there is another side that, you know, there is more to life than meets the eye. Maybe these things actually could have happened. Well, that's right. You can have lots of intellectual arguments, materialistic arguments. You can you can be absolutely, you know, just hiding, determined to just have your worldview. But human beings are not that simple. We're not machines. We, we are spiritual. We look at a sunset and we say it's beautiful. Why? The hat of souls no evolutionary purpose. You know, we listen to music and it's, we say it's great. We like poetry. We are more than machines. We're spiritual. And then, of course, we have thoughts, concerns, issues, principles, and they're all non-physical. We have beliefs, and justice, and we'll live for that. We'll die for that. These are non-physical realities that we take very seriously. So this makes you think there must be more to life. And those experiences, I think the enemy made a mistake. He showed too much of his hand, and uh, I, I was off then. My worldview was changing. And that's something that you very much bring into the songs. You want to encourage people to realize that there is actually this spiritual dimension to things, so that even when you're talking about things like you know propaganda and social engineering and conspiracy theories and these sorts of things that you're you, you're also saying at the same time to people as it, if you like a greater conspiracy that's going on that sort of knits all this together and that is this uh, spiritual opposition to god that is there and you're also saying to people you know open your eyes to the fact that there is a, a, a greater spiritual reality who is god and you're doing that inside the songs and one that you do that particularly well with is the man behind the curtain from your 2012 album weapons of mass deception and if i'm reading it right you seem to you allude to all these themes and you stitch them together with this reference to the wonderful wizard of oz <laughs> by l yeah. frank Baum yeah, yeah. throughout the song and you've got all those things like i was saying in the propaganda you know peer pressure social engineering all those but but you you also alert people to the fact that they're being manipulated spiritually at the same time so that they're there's a tendency to ignore the creator, of course, who is the ultimate answer to all of our concerns. Yeah. And you do that particularly in this song with, with a passing reference to John Lennon, which I'd like to comment upon. So we're going to hear it this is, in yeah, a moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're going to hear this in a minute. But could you first sort of, you know, tease apart some of those ideas there, you know, the sort of cons conspiracy ideas and yet also this this spiritual message that's that's underneath those lyrics all the time? Well, my experience in life has, has pretty much always been this even as a non-christian that you do not go away from the official line the official story you believe what you're told and that's that you know you read what the newspaper says digest it move on you know and I, it's just not in that's just not good enough to me i, I can't live i can't be lied to <laughs> absolutely <laughs> neither can i i agree but, with you yes it doesn't mean i know everything's true and that's true and it doesn't mean i'm not being lied to now what but i want to know the truth i want to seek the truth yes. about things whether it's about the climate or it's about whatever or it's uh, and so and so and um, a lot a lot of it's been given the freedom isn't it the space to disagree to say well i have not convinced yet yeah, yeah. In many cases, not to say I definitely think such and such is not true or such and such is true, but to have that space to say, well, look, you're telling me I've got to you know, toe the line in some way. The media is saying, oh, this is the case. Everybody agrees this is the case. And we're just saying, aren't we, we need that space to be ourselves, to be our own mind and say, well, I'm not convinced yet. And that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah. We talked about those demonic entities uh, you know, earlier on. That's small fry, in my opinion. You know, manifestations of gooey, you know, scary things. That's nothing. That's nothing compared to the real battle, which is for the mind. And it comes through philosophy. It comes through how you think and how you're encouraged to think. Mm. And Jesus talks a lot about this world. You know, you no longer belong to this world. It doesn't mean you don't belong to the earth or the 
the road or the sea or something. It, it means that you don't belong to the world, the cosmos, the system, the, the philosophy of this world, the vain philosophies of this world, the system, the way it's set up. It's under fallen angel authority. It's under Satan. That's what the biblical worldview is right now. Yes. Soon to change. Absolutely. We are in an info war, to use the, the title of Alex Jones's website there, but it's a bigger info war than uh, is often thought. That's right. And so I'm determined, whatever the subject is, to at least seek the truth about whatever it is. I believe Jesus Christ is the truth. But what does that mean? Oh, he's just the truth. It's just a statement. He's the truth, I believe, about who we are, who made us, where we come from, how we can get saved, how we can know God, who God is, where we go when we die the future prophecy the nations blah 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 he's the truth and he answers all those the bible answers all those things he's the truth about all those things when pontius pilate said what is truth he was looking at the person who is the source of truth and if you go to him you'll find out so since that's the thing that spiked me you know i see a world of lies 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 damn lies and I'm afraid that's the case. It is a world of lies. And we're to have nothing to do with the works of darkness, according to Scripture. But we are to nevertheless expose the works of darkness. That's what I want to do. I want to expose the darkness with the light of Christ. And we see this working out in all sorts of things. If you only study history, history is the history of cons conspiracy, the history of man conspiring. And then you read the Bible and you've got Revelation 18 and it's conspiracy. It's, it's conspiring against illegally against God or against man or against whatever. And so we're encouraged, particularly in our time now, it is like we're you know heading on the yellow brick road. To, we've left Kansas. We're on our way to see the Wizard of Oz. And the whole thing's a big lie. We're heading on down the road, skipping and a dancing to the tune of whatever they've told us, to, whatever tune they've given to us and whatever words they've told us to sing. And, and I'm saying they, I'm talking about the world elites. I genuinely believe this world is ruled by Satan by Lucifer, by fallen angels, and underneath that come fallen men who are allegiant to that, have been bought off by that, and that they are very small, probably tens of, just 10,000 odd people ruling this world, and we're influenced by media, how we think. Every day it's a battle. I find it's a battle. I go out into the world, to my workplace. Every day you're bouncing up against the opposite worldview that you have if you're a Christian, being coerced to change your view with pressure, because we're all sheep and we and sheep don't like to be outside of the group. And, you know, Dean Gotcha spoke about this on that last interview, that one interview you did. You know, we like the feeling of belonging. But th that, that song, Man Behind the Curtain, basically is about that subject. You know, don't join the dots. Don't ask any questions. Just carry on. You'll be happy. Just happiness is all that matters. Truth is irrelevant. Just stay happy. No problem. Ask no questions. You'll hear no lies. And then we'll get to see the Wizard of Oz. But pay no attention to that bloke behind the curtain because the whole thing's a sham. <laughs> and, and pretty soon the enemy's going to walk from behind the curtain and he's going to say, I am the great liberator. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think we're heading for the most amazing cosmic time in history on the stage of things between good and evil. We're in a cosmic battle, I believe, that has been going, been railing for centuries, millennia. And we are the pawns in it, but we're very important pawns because Jesus has saved us. We have eternal life and we belong to the to his side now that we've been redeemed. But I have to speak about these things. I can't live in in this world without talking about things, helping other people. I came to know Jesus through someone telling me about, hey, by the, by the way, look behind the curtain. You have an enemy. <laughs> you know, there is a truth. The gospel's true. There is something that happens when you die. Oh, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that. But the truth is... The most important thing is what happens when you die. And I have I hear a lot of people saying, stop talking about death and what happens after you die. Worry about that when you're about to die. This world is what matters. And I think that's a, an illusion because you want to be worrying about what happens when you die now so that you're prepared. And Jesus said, if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life. But if you don't, you won't. And that's a very serious issue. That's the issue. It doesn't matter all our differences on biblical truth or whatever. Don't matter when you're about to die. The only thing that matters is whether you can face God and be righteous before him. The big conspiracy of the enemy is to get us, is to keep us away from getting to that point. And it can be a conspiracy of interruptions. It can just be a bus, double, like C.S. Lewis said, you know, a double-decker bus going down the road, just stop you thinking from God. It could be anything like that. But um, on a bigger scale, the way we're taught, the things we're taught through our education system. My, my wife's a teacher. I mean, I can talk about these things from reading in books, but my life really experiences the New World Order. It really experiences these people ruling. It's biting there. It's real. 
you know, my kids have been through the education system, through the sausage factory. They're encouraged. Their dialectic is an anti-God dialectic. Uh, my wife's teaching. She goes to has to teach this stuff. It's 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 like it's like Daniel living in Babylon when she has to go to work. She doesn't believe a word of the stuff she's having to teach because it's not even education. It's just indoctrination that comes from the United Nations, from the Common Core. You know, so I've ranted on a bit, but seriously, it's, it, it's real. It, this is real stuff. It actually works out in real life. It's not just reading a book and saying I have a different philosophy to that. I'm now finding where the philosophy starts to bite and affect how people think and therefore how they act. And then the spiritual decisions and the eternal consequences of those decisions. Let's actually hear this song, because I think this the man behind the curtain really brings all of those ideas together, doesn't it? I mean, in a sense, I kind of think of this as, a you know, your truth movement song, but the truth movement in the kind of the biggest sense, the real truth, you know, it's got both of those messages in there, you know, what we normally think of as the truth movement, but also this bigger spiritual thing that you've just been talking about, in, in which all of these other questions are embedded, but not everybody seems to be aware of that, and that this song is, is constantly prompting people to be aware of that greater truth that there really is is a god that christ has died for us and you know trying to say look be aware of that as well so let's hear this song this is man behind the curtain this is uh, from the album weapons of mass deception
Now, during this interview, we've kind of dipped in and out of your testimony as we've gone along and uh, as to how you came to believe in Christ. And if people actually want to read your whole testimony, you you published the whole thing on the band's blog, and I think it's well worth reading that. It's a fascinating read, actually. It, during that testimony, you write, While in America, I witnessed the scariness of the slums and back streets of the cities. Detroit was nicknamed Murder City and boasted the highest statistics for knifings and shootings. I had a rude awakening to the reality of this world and the cheapness of life, and it caused me to look for hope. And what I wanted to ask you about is how significant would you say that that experience there in Detroit was for you in your journey towards faith? I'd say that that was a that was a real uh, game changer. I I really uh, I was really upset in my heart, in my spirit. I was troubled by the world we live in, and I guess being in Detroit, you know, I'd led a pretty sheltered life, you know, pretty you know safe life up to then, and I guess I just got a glimpse of uh, the real world, and I guess there's a lot more of it out there as well. That was just a tiny bit, and uh, I just became mm-hmm. you know someone could die there and no one would care. You know, I could have gone missing, and it would have been weeks before someone you know. And, and then I start then I started thinking life's cheap and. I was really upset and I couldn't find any hope in the world. I, I, I didn't know what the hope was, where the goodness was. You know, it wasn't in me. Uh, I knew that I wasn't the answer uh, and I didn't see it in other things. Uh, even the good guys were, weren't weren't as great as you thought they were once you got to know them. So that, I think that really led me to want to find, to seek the right thing. And I had heard previously in previous years about Jesus being good. Uh, so, that started to play in my mind and led me to the, led me to that to, to seek to, to look at that. Yeah, mm. there seem to be a number of times during your testimony where you seem to be almost on the edge of coming to faith in Christ, mm. but not just not quite coming there because you have all these people who come into your life, oh, yeah. the guys you've been talking about before, and like you know, sort of saying to you, shouting out, you know, you know, you're you think you're cool, and yeah, you know, but the real answer is Jesus. And then this guy that you talk yeah. to, you know, is a, the, the, you know the, the caretaker is a, telling you these things, giving you the testimony of his own life, how his own life has changed, and like you're on the edge all the time, but yeah. You know, it was quite a long time. So what actually was it that caused you? I mean, obviously, it's it's God working through things. But was there any moment where you could say, I, I actually became a Christian at that point? Well, I'd come back from the States. I'd heard the gospel from another girl called Lisa. She was like a, from in Nashville. And she'd, just t- she'd read uh, the first chapter of John to me. In the beginning was the word. The word was God it hit me right between the eyes that was when the word of god hit me between the eyes and all this stuff about the world and revelation and interesting things that have been we've been discussing here those f- kind of went blurry and the real issue was where did i stand with jesus and here was jesus being told he is the way the truth and life he is the word of god who became flesh he became a man god became a man and he was the lamb of god apparently i didn't understand fully that what it meant but he came to take away the sins and he was the light and the and the light of men but the darkness had not understood this idea that he was a light he was a single light even if in my mind it was a candle i don't think he's that now i think he's the light but you know my mind then was even if a candle if there's one candle and everywhere else is darkness that candle still wins and I was thinking, Jesus, even if he's the only person ever in the world who's perfectly right and light and good, then life does have a meaning. There is truth. There is love, true love and goodness. So I was convinced that Jesus was the real deal then. I came back to Britain, sleeping at my folks' house and had a dream. In this dream, I'd been, I'd been at the airport waiting to catch the plane to heaven, <laughs> like you do. I went up. I went to get onto to go up this escalator. With all these other people were getting on, they weren't rushing. There was no rush. They were just getting on to go and board, board the plane. And then this guy comes up to me and says, "What's your name?" I said, "Andy." He goes, "Ah, oh, I don't think you quite understand. You've got to be. It's not about saying you believe. You've got to give your whole life to Jesus. You've got to die to yourself, repent, and put your whole trust in Him. It's not about religion. Don't get religious." And you know, I thought, well, I've been to churches and I've seen people. I'm kind of a Christian. I wasn't. You know, I hadn't surrendered my life to God. He took me to this little side lounge where we sat drinking cocktails at the bar, discussing with these other people that were there that also obviously had the same conversation I had with this bloke. And uh, woke up, and I, I, that was the first time I ever prayed to God. And I said to God, I said, you have spoken to me. I've been messing around. I'm going to get this sorted out now. And uh, that that week, 
kind of just was a bit normal. Then I just got into wanting to see it in ways I'd never thought of doing, taking things, doing things and whatever I didn't really want to do. Lost all the interest and everything. And then my friend Tom said, Andy, do you want to come to uh, hear a preacher? There was this guy called Terry Law. who's a straight up and down uh, gospel preacher. And uh, I didn't really want to go. I wasn't in the mood. It was a misty night. And he just said, oh, come on. And so I just went along. I uh, got there. The guy gave a straightforward gospel about Jesus being the word of God and things I knew. And he just said, does anyone want to uh, give their life and testify before men and become a believer in Jesus this night? And I, that was when I went up and got saved. And I just went up, confessed, repented. And some guys prayed with me. I was filled with the Holy Spirit, got saved. That was it. I went away a new man. Fantastic. Yeah. It sounds like you were under some spiritual attack just before that. When you say you have you went down into this sort of trough of, of sinfulness really yes. just before. It was like it was a last battle there. Yeah, yeah. It was strange. I wanted to do things I'd never been interested in doing before. Mm. It's strange. So that was it. Got saved. Wonderful. After all that kind of messing about and then eventually got that and that was it and then from that point onwards i was born again i was just like buzzing i was the rest is another story fantastic yeah, yeah. well i actually want to play a final song uh, this is again from your first album and that's the song real love and i think it it really does encapsulate what we've been talking about here because it addresses a lot of the darkness that we can experience in life and that's going back to your detroit experience there uh, but it does you don't leave us with that in the song it points towards Christ as the source of real love, hence the title. So this is uh, Real Love, and it's from the first album of Dissident Prophet.
Well, after that, the man on the cross died to set you free, real love. There's nothing in a sense that needs to be added to that. But I'm nevertheless going to ask you if there's anything, as we're drawing to a close here, if there's anything that you would like to add as a kind of parting message before we close. Well, I don't know. If anyone's listening, they admit that they're a sinner. You can admit that you've broken God's God's laws. you lied, cheated, stolen, whatever, mid adultery. I've got news for you. You qualify to become a son of God, to become born again and to become adopted in God's family. If you can't come to terms with the fact, if you can't be honest, you can't qualify. But Jesus raises up the humble. You, you either be humbled or you humble yourself. But God wants you just to come clean. Come out with your hands up and say, it's a fair cop, Gov. I've sinned against you, Lord. That qualifies you to get saved. And Jesus died on the cross for your sins to pay fully. There's nothing you've done that cannot be paid for. There's no sin great, too great. And he wants to save you. He didn't do it in vain. He took all that effort, all that time, the whole Old Testament, all the things that were came about with Israel and all that stuff and the Messiah coming through that and all the history. God went to all that trouble to get that guy to become a man, to die on a cross, to rise again. And he's seated on the right hand of the Father now. He's risen again and he's coming back again. But before he comes back, he wants you to repent, to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord. He rose from the dead and that he died for your sins. I did it. I've been saved. You can be saved too. That's it. Fantastic. Fantastic. And as you say, we all qualify. And I'm going to say straight away, I qualify too. There's there's something or other that every one of us has done that is uh, disobedient towards God, that God is displeased with. And so we all qualify. But as you say, that salvation is there for every one of us. It's a free gift. We only have to avail ourselves of it. And uh, it's a it's great good news indeed. And so thank you very much for sharing that with us. Um, could I ask you, just before we do close, to tell us where people can find the music of Dissident Prophet? I think it's uh, dissidentprophet.com. I think you can go to SoundCloud, stroke Dissident Prophet. You can link to that from our main site, which is dissidentprophet.com. It goes straight through to Bandcamp, our Bandcamp page. If anyone wants to come see us play live, we're playing um, Kingstock Festival in the summer on the 31st of August. It's in the heart of Cambridge. So Wonderful. Well, Andy, thanks ever so much for coming on. It really has been great getting to know you actually a little bit better after getting to know your music over the last few weeks and uh, very much coming to appreciate what you do with the music. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's been really, really enjoyable, stimulating conversation. Thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Julian. A pleasure. Really enjoyed it. You have been broken. I have seen the damage that the world has done. Been through hell and all your dreams have come to nothing one by one but now the tide has turned this is the dream you never knew you had now you will walk with me and i will set you free
And if you feel like crying, cry, cry. And I will cry with you. And if you feel like laughing, laugh with me. And if you feel like dancing, dance, dance. And I will dance with you. And if you feel like resting, rest with me.